Senator Tim Scott, welcome to Ruthless. Well, thank you very much. It's good to be on the show. Well, listen, we are so happy that you've joined us. Uh, we think you are amongst the most thoughtful, uh, intelligent members of the United States Senate. And I, and I don't pass out compliments like that. Everybody, I've been around long enough to be pretty cynical about, <laughs> about senators and politicians. I, I'm just constantly impressed by the work that you and and your staff does on a day in and day out basis. And, and I wanna start there because you wrote an op-ed this week in the Washington Post. And we don't yes. always advocate that our, list, that our listeners read the Washington Post. I want, I want you to know that. But in this case, it is a must yes. read. And this op-ed by you is entitled, Let's Set the Record Straight on Woke Supremacy and Racism. You know, one of the challenges that we have when you have soundbite opportunities on TV is you have a soundbite opportunity. It's just not very long. So when you think about something as important as discrimination, racism, and the roots of it, you, you can't go very far without touching on the really three and a half centuries of, of America's history, as provocative as it is on the issue of race, and oppression, and discrimination, uh, slavery, the original sin, but when you look into the future, it's undeniable that if it were if it was wrong for you as a white guy to discriminate against me, then it is equally as wrong for me to discriminate against you. This new woke culture seems to reinforce and then codify in law that the theory of an eye for an eye is the way that we should live our lives. And I'm a person who believes that there's a better choice, that there's a simply a better option. That option is for us to work on a great opportunity society that creates a fair playing field for everyone. And unfortunately, if you look at the latest COVID package, what you don't walk away with, walk, walk away from it, is some theory of fairness. You can't first give $86 billion to labor unions, pension plans that have over-promised and under-delivered and call that fair to those people who are paying the taxes. You can't ask for the average American family to pay $22,000 to provide COVID relief, air quotes, on a package that is a progressive payment plan and not about COVID relief. You certainly cannot codify into law that it's okay for us to help all struggling farmers except white ones. Right. Having been on the wrong end of racism most of my life, the last thing that ever could make sense to me is making it legal to discriminate against anyone. Because if you make it legal to discriminate against one race of people, you have certainly made it legal to discriminate against all other races that you that fall out of favor whenever that happens. And so listening to my friends on the on the left about this about wokeism, I just fundamentally disagree with their approach to solving the problems of our nation. We have problems, but let's not add wokeism to the list of problems. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing that sort of is mind boggling to me is how you have been able to stay so patient and um, so calm about a political environment that ultimately you watch Speaker Nancy Pelosi, Majority Leader Chuck Schumer go to a press conference with kente cloths and all of a sudden claim to speak for the African-American community. And that's got to just frustrate you to no end. Well, there's no question that when you, uh, let me just be blunt, Josh, as I, as I rarely am. Virtue signaling is one of the worst concepts for real justice I've seen. And having the right clothing on, the right garb on, should not make me feel better about what you or anyone else has done to me. Uh, <laughs> the way I look at it is the, the, the greatest supporters of, the, of, of, of uh, you know, of the, the liberal left now, the, the think about think about Hollywood, think about their construct around labor bosses. And here's the one thing you can think about, 
go back to 1931 with the Davis-Bacon Act, and you'll come to the conclusion very quickly that labor wanted to eliminate competition, and most of the competition it wanted to eliminate was small black businesses winning federal government contracts. So they codified in law this concept of a minimum wage that must be paid to all employees to get rid of black businesses. It's, it's that simple. Think, if you will, about how often Hollywood depicted African Americans in the most vile, subhuman or, or dehumanizing ways. And, and now you see this flurry of TV commercials suggesting that everybody's equal now. Well, for 80 years, you said that Tim Scott and people that look like me, we were criminals, we were the least of these, we were the forgotten, the disenfranchised, you, they reinforce this image on screen after screen after screen after screen for eight decades. And all of a sudden, an epiphany occurs, and they are now going to tell me what I should think about myself. Wow. That's tough. It's just fascinating, frustrating, and absolutely outside this universe I live in. Can you... Can we still have these conversations in the way that you... I mean, you... you you put yourself out there and I just applaud your, your bravery because you're, you keep going at it. You keep having candid, honest conversations and time and again, you're met with huge intolerance on the left. So, uh, racism, outright racism. Um, I, can we still have this conversation? You know, with that, I've often said without civility in the public forum, the, the size and the grandeur of our dreams, our aspirations and our ideas begin to shrink. They shrivel because we need civil discourse. We need to be able to debate the greatest issues of our time. We need to be able to look into the future and say that here is a problem. And if we don't have a public forum that is fit for disagreement, for strong debate, we will not be able to solve the greatest problems this world has ever seen because those problems have not yet arrived. Uh -huh. And when that day comes, it has to be America, the city on the hill, a light that shines beyond our borders, telling people that this is the way of due north. Losing that position levels, not the playing field, but levels this notion of hope an opportunity for the world and not just here at home. Oh man, that is that is music to my ears. I agree with every single word that you said. So let's transition to something that's currently happening because I, I think I've found great amusement in Senate Democrats talking about the filibuster uh, as a, a Jim Crow oh. relic, uh, while also, <laughs> Uh, forgetting that, like, you know, we're like seven months re removed from filibustering your police reform bill. How do you, how are they square in that circle? Yes. Well, you know, they, they must have very, very short memories, number one, because the truth <laughs> of the matter is that if you just go to the most recent past, the, the, the most effective use of the filibuster was to stop racial progress in the justice system on my Justice Act. Let me, let me say that a little slower, just in case you have some liberals listening. Yes. The yes. filibuster was used to stop resources like the duty to intervene, like de-escalation training that could have helped Kenosha, Wisconsin from actually happening. It stopped between coupling the Justice Act and President Trump's executive order we could have had co-responders, perhaps funded and prepared to deal with those folks who are unstable mentally, but outside of that, not a threat. In other words, the, the literal dollars that could de-escalate and save lives was blocked by the filibuster on the left not because of its racist past, because I'm not sure that it has one, but because they were using any tools necessary to stop the Republican Party and my legislation from being seen in the eyes 
of victims of real discrimination differently. They did not want the Republican Party and my legislation to be the difference maker on a, I mean, a host of issues from body cameras to no-knock warrants to the choke call to uh, get, 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 gathering more data to best practices nationwide. They, they stopped all of that from becoming law. And now, somehow now, the filibuster is a relic from a racist past. Well, A, it's been around forever, and B, uh, the civil rights era saw Republicans and Democrats come together with more Republicans than Democrats voting for civil rights legislation in the 60s. So the truth be told, we, <laughs> Let me, Josh, can I just say this uh, quickly? Yeah, well, of course. If I can get if I can get the general public to think that the Republican Party is racist, then nothing the party says, nothing the party does will matter. Because if I believe you don't see me as equal and human, I won't think of you at all. The Democrat strategy has less to do with solving problems of our racial past and more to do with solving the problem of power in the future. Oh. That's what this filibuster debate is really about. 100%. And they will lose the day they get rid of that. Yeah, well, I, yeah, I want to get into that. But, but to your point, explicitly, they're getting rid of it for HR1, right? It's not, it, this is not about an improvement to any lives in America. It's about trying election system that gives them a better chances every November. When you look at HR1 or S1, one of the things you have to walk away with is asking, scratching your head. Now, I, I don't know if I agree that every 16 year old is ready to be a, a participant in our election process. Lord As a matter of fact, I'm pretty, <laughs> I'm pretty sure that old Tim Scott, as good of a football player as he was, was not ready for a civics lesson or the advanced citizenship that is required here in America. Therefore, when you're able to serve in our nation's military, I think you should have the right to vote. When you can put your life on the line for this country, you should have the right to determine the future of this country. Uh, so I, I think of it as very, very simple. This is nothing more than a power grab taking power from the states and nationalizing it and then, of course, they're going to add states to make sure that they have this new majority that is bulletproof. Once they change the law, they must change the system of who votes in order to keep that system in place. That does not sound like racial progress in any way, shape, or form. That sounds like a liberal takeover of America's future. It's one of the reasons why I consistently say their, their goal is to fundamentally transform what it means to be an American. Yeah, that, there's no question. That is absolutely right. And, and they're trying to stack the decks so sufficiently well, against any sort of conservative that it's impossible to compete. I mean, the, all the various reforms contained within H.R. 1, S. 1, but ultimately what doing away with the filibuster means in terms of making D.C. a state, Right which ultimately, yes. you know, they, they lead you to believe that's about voting rights for people, it's about voting rights for people. It's about two more Democratic senators. That's what it's about. 100%. I mean, they, listen, the, the one thing that uh, they do not do on the left is waste a crisis. Right. I mean, the COVID relief package is is 9% COVID health care, 1% vaccine, and 90% progressive wish list. I mean, they refuse to, so if we had five COVID relief packages, that passed under Republican control of the Senate, Republican in the White House, with 90 votes in the Senate, the first relief package by Democrats that is not a relief package was voted purely by partisans. Because when you no longer are focused on the relief of people suffering because of COVID, and you're only focusing on the future of liberal policies, you, you kind of lose all the Republicans. Uh, this is kind of simple common sense from my perspective. <laughs> Call me, I'm even looking for John Desai. I'm not really sure, but I, I think this is a common sense. 
so we've got we know we've got to fight fight them with everything we've got on their agenda but the one thing i ask you i don't ask everybody this but i i think you're sort of uniquely positioned because of how you view the world and your sort of optimism in addition to beating back bad liberal ideas that set us back culturally economically and everything else how do we turn this around right how, how do we get back to arguing for optimistic conservative principles in a clear way. You know, Josh, great question. And the answer is kind of simple. Uh, the, my synopsis on the answer is we have to go where we're not invited. We literally have to start campaigning and marketing in areas that we've never thought of before. Because what has happened is if you watch MSNBC, and unfortunately it's on in my gym, I wish they would just turn that TV off, uh, but they won't. I've asked the manager and the manager said, seriously, dude, uh, we have Fox too. I'm like, well, we need to have Fox and Fox Business then to make up for MSNBC being on the screen way too much. Uh, but if you watch MSNBC, you never ever hear anything other than those guys over there are racist. The black ones and the white ones are all racist. I love my mama. I'm not sure what, you know, why is that such a surprise to people? I don't know. But literally, here's what we have to think to ourselves. We have to find a way to get into that space where people of good intent are being brainwashed, frankly, because they're having this drip system. It's just drips on them all day long that Republicans are racist. Republicans are racist. Republicans are racist. When you hear that all the time, here's what you forget, by the way, Josh. Here's what you have to forget in order to believe that those concepts. Or that, or that mindset. Number one, you have, to, you have to forget the fact that under the last three Democrat presidents, they were unable to make funding for historically black colleges and universities permanent. But under the Republican administration, we made it permanent. We also, according to the head of the United Negro College Fund, took it to a record level of funding. We also focused our attention on the research on rare blood diseases and specifically on the research for sickle cell anemia, 100% black disease. This is, a, this, I'm talking about the racist party, by the way. Yeah, According right. to my friends to the left. We, yeah. we took the unemployment rate for the first time in the history of this country to under 6% for African-Americans. At the same time we took the unemployment rate down, we took the labor, the labor force participation rate within, within the black community, we took that up which is really hard to do, by the way, because as you know, there's, a, there's typically an inverse relationship. It's easier to take your unemployment down as long as your labor force participation rate stays down. But when you're, uh, I'm probably getting a little too wonky here. Let, let yeah, me just continue on. Uh, we, saw, <laughs> All right. we saw poverty go, go to the lowest level since 1959. The first time we started recording, we've never seen poverty this low. The, the, the wage inequality gap started to shrink. Why? Because President Trump's economic policies, creating 7 million jobs, bringing two thirds of those jobs into the households of women, brown people and black people, actually lowers uh, that income inequality. First, second thing that it did was the lowest quintile, the, the bottom quintile had a 5% increase in income, while the top was around 2.7. So in other words, free market policies and a responsible level of regulations, the coupling of those two drove pressure to the bottom where the wages went up faster than at the top. That closes the income inequality gap. And because we had a 41% black homeownership rate in 2016, we have a 46.4% at the end of 2019 heading into the pandemic. We also see the wealth gap go down because the difference between black wealth and white wealth predominantly is in the equity in a home. So when you start seeing the numbers go up in the black community and home ownership, you see the numbers go down from a wealth gap. Huh. If we solve the issue of education, we now have the great opportunity party full speed ahead. So we do two things. Number one, we answer your question about how do we get things on the right track? And B, we demonstrate to a watching world that not only is the Republican Party not racially insensitive, we are pro 
We are the party of progress, not progressive party, but the party of progress for all Americans. Because we did that at the same time, we lowered Asian unemployment rate to under 3%. We lowered Hispanic unemployment rate to 4.2%. We lowered white unemployment to 3.1%. We lowered female unemployment to a 70 year low. So the market is the fastest way for us to get parity, not mandates around equity, but mandates around opportunity. We want those who put in the same thing to get out the same thing. We don't want an unequal distribution. If you put in differently, you should get out differently. Right. right. This is, you know, talk about a five tool player, Senator. You just made an X lesson, uh, you know, pretty uplifting. I, and, and <laughs> it's something worth listening to. That's tough. That's tough to do. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I love it. Yeah, so, so I fell civics and I like math, so I tried to put the two together. You did it, and I can't believe you did it because there's basically nobody who can do it. Like Ross Perot tried, right? And that's kind of like the last guy I think that had any success at it. But what I just heard from you makes a ton of sense. I love it. I got three impressions, though, and I got to get to you. I wish we could yes, spend sir. two Let's hours talking about all of this, but I got to get to these three because they cut to the soul of every politician. And we act, you know, this yes, is, these are revealing things here. So your last uh -oh. meal on earth, Scott, what would it be? Well, last meal on earth would start, of course, with an appetizer of a uh, order of French fries from McDonald's. My entree, of course, would be the largest burger, a double beef patty with cheddar cheese in the middle, melted in the middle, of course. Uh, it would be followed with dessert. It would be my haagen butter pecan ice cream that I'm now allergic to. After 50 years of living, I became allergic to ice cream. God, God, what? humor. Uh, and so I would finish it off with that ice cream. So I haven't had it in five years. Well, and you don't have to worry about the allergic reaction at that point, right? Because it's, yes. Yes. You know, you're, you're on your way, way out. out. Yes. <laughs> Awesome. All right. So if you were not involved in politics, if you were not in the United States, what would you be doing with your life? You know, I would be a uh, more of an evangelist. I would love to travel the country and the world sharing the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, I think there's a lot of life lessons that uh, our country was built upon. The Judeo-Christian foundation of this nation is why people who don't believe in either faith or Christianity or, or the Jewish faith, uh, you, you still have a place. You have, we, we are supposed to be tolerant of people who are not like ourselves. That is embedded in the founding father's perspective of this nation. As flawed as they may have been, they founded us upon the right rock and that rock does not move. So if I could share some of the biblical principles around economics, around faith, around hope and love, I, I think it would be a life worth, worth living. Yeah, beautifully said. All right, so here's the third and final question. Yes, sir. What motivates you more, the victory or the agony of defeat? Absolutely the thrill of victory. All right. All right. Well, that's good, you know, because here's the thing. Everybody comes at these things differently. I had McConnell was on the program on Tuesday, and he tried to convince me that yes. the thrill of victory for him. But I know, like, he celebrates his victories for about 30 seconds and starts working to pr try to prevent the next loss, right? So, so I can yes. call him out on it. You are, I think, one of the most transparently obvious thrill of victory guys I've ever met. <laughs> well, I love the victory. Listen, I, I, I actually love it so much that I, I root for teams that one day will win. So I keep my thrill of victory waiting for next season, whether I'm a Gamecock fan or a Dallas Cowboys fan. Uh, while I love the thrill of victory, I have to look back 25 years to remember a Super Bowl or, frankly, an 11 win season was right. about a decade ago for my game cock, but I love winning. I do love winning and I don't like changing horses in the middle of the race. This is a lifelong race and we're going to, we're going to win another Super Bowl. I know well, we are 2032 is going to be our way. With, with leaders like Senator Tim Scott, I feel like the Republican party is going to be doing an awful lot of winning. I can't thank you enough for the time that you spent with us, but more importantly, the work that you're doing, which everybody follow what he's doing on a day-to-day -day basis. It's incredible. It's really helpful for conservatism, our party, ultimately our country. So thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Jessica, being with you.